Welcome everybody. Um, real quick, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, so welcome back. We're excited to have you back. For those of you who haven't been here before, um, just a quick introduction on Distributed Global. Uh, these are our offices, and uh, we're an investment firm. Uh, we've been investing and supporting blockchain businesses for, for six years now, and uh, we are, it's been our, our first year here in New York. Uh, we moved in March. Um, we get to share the space with, with some amazing teams. We have Live Peer, Hashgraph, Bison Trails, Gauntlet, um, and uh, we had some Tesla's team here, and so it's been a really wonderful experience on that front. Terminal, of course. Sorry, it's hard to, to remember everything when you're up here in front of these beautiful faces. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, we also get to do these events, so this has been a wonderful experience for us to, to engage with the crypto community. There's an amazing blockchain crypto community out here in New York, and, uh, and we've been really excited to, to meet each and every one of you, and uh, we look forward to connecting more uh, in the future. Um, so anyway, we have a great show for you tonight, and uh, without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, wow. Ryan John King. Thank, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jeff. Thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about foam and the importance of time synchronization. Um, so the fundamental tenet of foam in the, is the proof of location protocol, and the way it works is through time synchronization. So we have these fixed radio beacons that are called zone anchors that can d discover each other and together synchronize their clocks, establish a zone of coverage, and in doing that, they maintain a quorum over time and space. So they're kind of the authorities of that zone, like a time zone. Um, and so before I'm gonna go into kind of a historical analysis of how clock synchronization worked um, in spatial ways and an update on progress of where we are in that. Um, so just to start, I'm just gonna show a quick video of how the protocol works before I go into it. So in the foam proof of location protocol, you, we have a radio beacon, which we call a zone anchor. Um, and to participate in the system, you have to stake tokens into a contract that you're gonna operate correctly. And to establish a zone, you need at least four zone anchors. Um, and these will synchronize their clocks over radio and establish a zone of coverage. So the reason you need four is the same reason you need four GPS satellites overhead to learn your location. One is for X, Y, Z, and a fourth is for time. So if you have at least four of these uh, beacons that establish a zone and synchronize their clocks, they can now service customers. So this is a location customer, uh, very abstract. Uh, that wants to purchase uh, presence claims. So that's an attestation about where it's been. So similar to GPS, you can figure out your location by listening to these synchronized clocks. Um, but what's different in the phone uh, scenario is that this kind of, you can speak back to the system. So you can't do that in GPS. And here uh, you have this presence claim that will then be stored on the zones blockchain and then checked uh, for verification for fraud um, and eventually stored on a parent <coughs> root blockchain. Um, so this is going to be unpacked later on, but I just wanted to show this as a primer um, so you have a little bit more understanding of what I'm talking about when I say foam and proof of location. Um, so the goal of this talk is to explain the importance of time synchronization in a proof of location system um, by way of historical examination. So as we will see, clock coordination and time synchronization has been a key factor in cartography through history and will continue to be for the phone protocol. Um, and so there's a pretty long history of time, um, ironically, of how we think about it. And um, the kind of most latest breakthrough has probably been with the advent of Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin kind of solves the time synchronization problem for its own use case. And it's a distributed ledger that uses gamification of a time stamping as a decentralization mechanism. And this is kind of the backbone of the system. Um, but taking even a step back through the history of time, um, how is time once thought of? Um, at one point, we had something called absolute time, also known as Newtonian time or Newtonian physics. Uh, and this was the conception that time existed outside of any one of us as a singular monolithic thing that always ticked the consistent pace um, and almost kind of created a ledger, like a linear history like uh, Bitcoin. But eventually, we had someone like uh, Einstein who came about, who said that time is not actually absolute. Um, there's an inseparable relation between time and signal, and under this theory, 
Um, we can actually only understand time in reference uh, to a coordinated system of clocks. So you need a system of clocks and our kind of relative reference point to understand time. And so in that model, this is kind of more what time looks like or could be thought of as not as a linear absolute thing. We now have space time and relativity. Um, and so today, uh, the way that we rely on distributed clock coordination powers our whole economy. And uh, one of those pieces of infrastructure that power our economy is GPS. So the Department of Defense has identified 14 out of the 16 major industries in the United States um, are critical to rely on GPS. So we use it for location as well as its timing accuracy. And just the way that GPS works, it actually proves Einstein theory of relativity because you have satellites in space um, basically moving around at different velocities uh, and basically the GPS calculations that your phone ultimately does has to account for space-time relativity uh, to, to keep this in uh, place. Um, so this is the critical piece of infrastructure we rely on today and GPS works through synchronizing all these clocks on an atomic level and broadcasting the time. So all the um, nodes in the system are in sync and because of that if you get at least four of those signals on your phone you can learn your location. Um, and one of the things that we're looking to address is that this system has a lot of issues. There's a lot of pitfalls. Um, it's not very secure. It can be attacked. Uh, it can be jammed. It can be spoofed. And too many things rely on it. And not enough people are working on an alternative. And this is primarily uh, what motivates us um, while working on foam is to actually solve the location problem head on, offering a brand new alternative to the infrastructure we've come to rely on. Um, but I'm going to continue uh, with the more historical analysis first. Um, so we have GPS time today that uses uh, atomic clocks that are synchronized to work for location. But that um, time that GPS uh, puts out is different than what we use for our own time. So there's a different system of atomic clocks uh, called international atomic time. And they keep a global standard of time um, for different systems. So we have a GPS time and now we have this Thai time. And then probably the one that you're more familiar with is called UTC time. So UTC time is based off of this Thai time but it takes into consideration leap seconds. So you're probably all familiar with leap years. Um, there are actually also leap seconds that some systems account for. And UTC time also tracks the Earth rotational speed. So the Earth may slow down or speed up, and that affects time. Um, and so this kind of system, there's a whole international body that regulates time zones. Uh, and you can see in this diagram that we actually today have this concept of zones and time synchronization and ways to kind of track time. And so really the point is that there is no single source of time that is truth. Um, there is no master clock and there is no single source. Uh, we have this GPS system and they have hundreds of clocks trying to synchronize and we have a separate system uh, working for all their use cases like a computer syncing. And so there really is no singular time today. There's nowhere to look to today as an authority to say this is the definitive time. And we truly live in this kind of space-time relativity where we just uh, basically look to the zone authority of our own time zone and we just rely on the zone. And so these concepts are basically something we live with today and something that foam protocol will leverage and bring into the world hopefully. Um, but looking back uh, kind of how time synchronization worked to structure society more historically, we can look at a concept called canonical time. And so canonical time was something that was maintained by the church in medieval times. Um, so the church was more than just a religious institution, it was also kind of the bedrock of society. And they maintained something called canon law. So the church would uh, maintain what was the right rate of silver, the weight of silver, or what different kind of equations were acceptable. And they also maintained time. And most people think that kind of medieval churches and so forth are so large and predominant because there was a religious society. But actually, these became one of the tallest and most expensive structures because it was had a clock tower and a clock bell. And so this was how basically people organized their lives and their days, by knowing what time it is. And they only had one place to look for. There was a centralized source of time in a local zone of a kind of a town. And this was a public good. It was broadcasted to everyone. Um, the bells rang, and everyone could hear them. So if, if the church wanted to cheat or lie about the time to trick someone for some reason, they had to trick everyone, and it kind of negates the uh, mistake. So we had canonical time at one point, um, and this was basically one person synchronizing their clock and having one source of truth that everyone could rely on. 
And uh, this is a quote from Nick Zabo, who has investigated this quite um, thoroughly, and he believes that kind of the relationship between productive synchronization of relationships that was funded by the bell towers kind of created this feedback loop where society could be more productive and organize themselves even better because they were able to regulate their activities by this bell tower, that they actually could break away of other kind of um, civilizations that weren't as well organized. Um, and this, we saw different timekeeping technologies and different institutions that came to structure um, modernity over the hundreds of years. And another major breakthrough in history is we see in the 14th century with the invention of uh, both the sand glass and the mechanical clock. So the sand glass basically was the first time that we had decentralized portable time. For the first time, people could carry around a way to measure time themselves. And this allowed them to even check the bell tower for fraud and be able to measure the hours themselves and see if this uh, church institution was telling the truth. So this is the first time people could actually keep time themselves and carried around. And with the advent of the mechanical clock, it kind of allowed time to be everywhere, um, not just relied on the bell tower. And this helped measure people's time so that we could then have contracts, uh, we could have jobs that were time-based and not just kind of indebted servitude. And so these were kind of major breakthroughs that helped structure society even further um, beyond just the bell tower. And I'm, I'm very fascinated by the um, sand glass being this kind of decentralized portable time um, for the first time. Um, and so once we have the mechanical clock, as history continued to advance, uh, we had the electro-coordination of clocks. So we had clocks in different places and different bell towers, but they eventually became to synchronize with themselves um, so that the clocks would always be the same no matter where you were in the city. Um, and this is a photo of a mechanical clock tower in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, it's where Einstein worked in a patent office. And he was surrounded by mechanical clocks that were synchronized uh, in his early career and was super intrigued by this idea of simultaneity and how do we know, how do we coordinate these things. And being around these kind of clocks influenced his work greatly. Um, so a bit further then in history, uh, we can look at time that was used in navigation. Um, but, so the way that people used to navigate in the seas was through a technique called dead reckoning. Um, and this was something that was extremely challenging and hard to do but it was a way that people measured how long they were going in one direction with the sand glass and would be able to follow someone's directions based on these vectors. So go west for one hour, go northwest for two hours, go south for one hour. Um, and it's pretty hard to do if you ask me. Um, and these kind of directions couldn't be mapped to any real map of the world or any Euclidean plane. There were only just these kind of spatial vectors. And it was becoming such a challenge for people to navigate the seas this way um, that there were a lot of shipwrecks and crashes and people dying on um, voyages. And it became so much of a problem that using this timing of a sand glass and tracing your directions, um, that governments eventually put out a competition, I think the government of England, to solve the longitude problem. So the reason people were kind of navigating the seas by tracking time on a sand glass and figuring their direction was because there's no natural elements to figure out your longitude. You can use celestial bodies to figure out your um, latitude, but longitude was much different. Um, and eventually someone came up with a new instrument called the chromi chromometer. And this was a marine-based clock um, that would basically be uh, isolated from the elements in a kind of casing and be super accurate. And they found that if you could track how long you were going based on uh, a reference point, so you could have two of those clocks, uh, you would be able to locate yourself on the longitudinal plane. And that's how we have Greenwich Mean Time as kind of a, a reference point, because that's what people would use when they set sail from England uh, to figure out their position on the map. They would basically use a clock. Um, so we went from navigating with a sand glass through, through some vectors to now being able to localize ourselves on a map thanks to synchronizing our clocks. Um, and eventually, basically, radio technology took over for this chromometer where we actually have uh, base stations that can broadcast the time and you can basically trilaterate yourself um, on the seas. So this really kind of time synchronization and radios played a huge role in industry, railroads, tel telecommunication, and really became a staple of interconnected modernity. And something I found really interesting during my research of time synchronization was that the Eiffel Tower was actually set to be demolished in 1909. Uh, the Parisian people really hated it, uh, they weren't a fan, and it was set to be demolished. 
until it was discovered that it could be used as a massive radio beacon. And so at once, the Eiffel Tower was the greatest radio synchronizer on the planet. And they could broadcast the position of Paris and uh, French colonies in Africa could tune in and synchronize their location and find out their position very precisely on the map. And once even the Eiffel Tower synchronized with the Naval Observatory here in Virginia in 1913, they were able to securely verify their lo longitude and verify these kind of international standards. Um, so this kind of stuff I found very fascinating, just looking at how time synchronization and these uh, iconic instruments have played such a massive role in how we organize ourselves as a society. Um, but fast forward a bit to today, um, where we have GPS for a global time, but most of our life is these days spent on the internet. And the internet is asynchronous, uh, because some people have very fast connections, some people have very slow connections, so there's always some delay or latency. Um, and on the internet, global clocks have been very difficult to kind of maintain, and Nick Zabo writes how on these kind of computer networks, someone could always make a Byzantine attack uh, when broadcasting time information. It could always be intercepted or kind of delayed in a way that's not reliable. So I, as I mentioned before, Bitcoin kind of addresses time synchronization on the internet as a way to come to a shared truth through time stamping. Um, all participants in Bitcoin are incentivized to maintain a ledger of transactions and order them by a timestamp. Um, and so even if the local clocks drift apart, there's always this kind of um, thing that you could look to, the ledger, and have the timestamp. So time stamping uh, was really crucial to the, basically the Bitcoin breakthrough. And I actually saw someone today post on Twitter um, proto Bitcoin code for before it was originally launched. And it actually says in the code a transaction uh, with the Merkle branch linking it to the time chain. So we actually see Satoshi was referring himself to the blockchain not as a blockchain, but as a time chain, uh, which is quite fascinating. Um, so since the advent of Bitcoin kind of addressing time synchronization um, through a Byzantine fault tolerant system, we've seen an explosion of academic research and uh, commercialized projects that are Byzantine fault tolerant, um, mostly in the blockchain space. Uh, and here's a tweet from Dominic Williams, one of the founders of Definity. And when he's talking about Byzantine fault tolerant um, systems, he says they come in three flavors. They're either synchronized, uh, they're temporally synchronized, they're partially synchronized, or they're asynchronous. Um, and the first two flavors make assumptions about how fast participants in the network can exchange messages. Uh, asynchronous does not make those assumptions, because you might have slow internet or fast. So for Ethereum, for example, asynchronous consensus. So looking now to uh, pass this kind of historical analysis of how time sync has been used and important, we're going to go into how it applies to the phone protocol itself. Um, and so what's interesting about this tweet to us is that the phone proof of location protocol is both synchronous, partially synchronous, and asynchronous. Um, and so what that means is, as I said in the beginning, we have these zones um, that are local and running uh, protocol over radio. So that is a synchronous time synchronization protocol, and they run it over radio in a local area. Um, then we rely on tender consensus, which is a proof of stake consensus model, and that's partially synchronous. Um, so some things happen in order, but the voting happens out of order. And so for us, this is what happens locally. You have local time sync in a local area, um, and then it's stored a partially synchronously on a tender. And we then rely on a parent chain, which would be asynchronous, so that's Ethereum, for example, where finality happens and where the end results ultimately end up. Um, and I think Foam is unique in that it's one of the only projects, if not the only one, that relies on the synchronous, partially synchronous, and asynchronous consensus models to ultimately come up with their proof. Um, so what we're working on and how we're using time synchronization is for proof of location. And so in the phone system, we want to come to consensus on whether an event or agent has verifiably been at a certain point in time and space. And so, uh, as I showed the GPS diagram, in the phone system, you would just have a zone that is local to one area. And these zone anchors who establish this zone, they have authority over this area. They're basically telling you what the time is, and they're keeping track of it, and they're publishing all their results so that you could check it out yourself. Um, and the system would automatically find any errors. But it's just important to think that this is, in a microcosm, its own time zone. Um, and it's just as valid as a time zone we have today because there is no single kind of time source. And so the system is allowing, in an autonomous, permissionless way, these zones to maintain a quorum over time and space in one area. 
So the foam proof of location <laughs> protocol relies on synchronized clocks and by extension triangulation. Uh, we use low power wide area network radios, which are these small cheap IoT devices. The system relies on crypto economics and incentivized proofs. And as I mentioned, we have different consensus models for what's happening locally and how to eventually speak to the global system. Um, so geolocation and time sync have a lot in common. And so the tenets of our protocol is that it would be Byzantine fault tolerant. It would work completely independent of GPS as its own standalone system. It's uh, trustless and permissionless to join and be a part of. And the system's driven by punishments and rewards. Uh, a repeat of what I just said. Um, so what does that really look like? Um, imagine that we had uh, these zone anchors, these radios, uh, and they were being hosted uh, all across the city. People would be installing them in their homes. Um, and they would start running the protocols. They would start broadcasting what time they think it is, everyone's broadcasting what time it is, and eventually they would come to some sort of synchrony. And then they would be able to know when they became unsynchronized to restart the process. So once they have their clock synchronized, they establish a zone. And so what it means when you've established a zone is you stake tokens behind your zone and you're basically saying, we promise to run this protocol properly, we promise to be in sync, and if you find us cheating, you can uh, get our tokens. And now once we have the zone up and running, um, people can use it. So you have these customers, for example, a car, and they can rely on this infrastructure as an alternative to GPS. They can still use GPS to figure out where they are, but in this system they can talk back and do these bi-directional transactions and generate these receipts about where they've been. And this part where the car is speaking back to the zone and generating a proof is what we're missing today. That's the missing piece. So today you can't talk to your GPS. And so in this case, if it's a decentralized um, Uber application, at the end of the trip, they would say, show me seven receipts along the route and you can get paid. So we're really looking to uh, open up this new infrastructure that does one singular thing, time synchronization, maintains a quorum of time and space in an area, and then opens up all new marketplaces and ways for applications to hook into. Um, so now I wanna just pivot to where we are today and how we've been working on this. So we've been investigating these low power radios, as I mentioned, uh, and that's how, going forward in how we're gonna actually run the software on them. But in the meantime, we've been coding the actual time sync protocol uh, and building the blockchain ar architecture. And so we wanted to find a way to test and simulate this in the lab uh, before we moved into the radio stage. And so that project was called the GeoPickle. So I'm gonna show a bit about how that came to be. And we call it that because it's geographic and pickle because it's the little guy. And it's something that's made up of 40 Raspberry Pis wrapped in a server. It's pretty rare for people to want to wrap Raspberry Pis like that. But it allows us to basically simulate um, zones and run this protocol um, across different devices. So I'll just go a bit into the creation of it. I think this is when the idea came at this exact moment. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> um, so what we did was we first had to find a way to rack Raspberry Pis and we found this uh, kind of esoteric firm in Australia that made these de devices called Bitscope Blade Quattros, which I really love. And it allows you to put in four Raspberry Pis. And for us that's perfect because a zone is a minimum of four nodes. So each uh, Bitscope Blade Quattro is a zone. Um, and it took a few weeks of assembling and ordering different parts uh, and testing it through so some of the work being done on that. Some soldering maybe occurred. Uh, it eventually got made. Uh, we all were in awe. Uh, and that's kind of a close up um, of the different parts. And so this was really exciting for us because now for the first time we have the first foam testnet um, of proof of location ever running. And it's completely radio agnostic. And that's perfect for us because we want this protocol to work on radios that exist today, but also ones that could exist in the future. So as a first step, we're able to test this basically in the lab. This is the full um, one where you have these 40 Raspberry Pis. So for us, we have basically 10 zones and they can we can simulate the whole protocol on it. So what does that really mean? And so this is an example where on that server rack, you have this switch and each of these larger rectangles is one of those blades and you have four Pis, but each can be a zone. And so what does that, uh, okay, this is another uh, just example of the interface of um, what, what, what I mean when we're doing, we can have them run, we can have them speak to each other over the wire and synchronize or not. So what does that really mean? It means that with the GeoPickle, we can now run 10 zones simultaneously and give them different parameters to see how they react. We can say, hey, they can hear each other half of the time, they can hear each other 80% of the time, they can't talk to each other at all, 
and be able to kind of um, test these different real world setups. We can start to introduce errors and say, you know, every 10th message fails, what happens then? Um, and this will be able to kind of infer how the validation and verification logic will ultimately be designed. Um, we can benchmark kind of presence claims and see how long does these things take to go through a zone, um, zone verification and back to an Ethereum chain. And we can test different kind of scaling solutions and tools. And like I mentioned, we're using Tendermint. We also are using Plasma, some things like counter verification. So on this GeoPickle, we can basically test and develop uh, all this software um, independent of any radios or beacons in the real world and just focus on the time sync and simulate those environments. So that's what we've been doing in the last month and we're basically at a turning point now uh, where the GeoPickle is built and we're starting these tests. Um, but like I mentioned, that's how we test time sync uh, agnostic of radios, but eventually, very soon, we're gonna have these on actual devices. And the protocol could be run on any type, but we're most interested in this new area of radio, which is called the low power wide area networks. Uh, why they're interesting is because they're very long range, but also a very long battery life. So something like Bluetooth that has long battery life, but it only goes 30 feet, you would need thousands and thousands of times more than you would need to cover a large area. And the one in particular that we're working with is called LoRa. Uh, it's a low power um, chirp spreading s uh, spectrum. It's low bandwidth, um, but it has really impressive kind of penetration abilities to go through concrete indoors, underground, uh, and in the best case can go up to 10 miles. So this is what we've tested and achieved uh, in the lab, two nanosecond level time sync. So it shows that this consumer grade um, accessible hardware can be used at a level that produces sub five meter accuracy. So two nanoseconds translates to about four meters. Um, most systems don't actually optimize for time sync and they synchronize to the millisecond or microsecond and that gets you then 100 meters or a kilometer. Um, so we found uh, by the end of last year that this is a very promising radio to use for our cases. And there are people deploying these radios like mad uh, everywhere right now, and not for time sync, but this is in Sydney, um, this is in Zurich. And people are running these lower radios for other IoT purposes, but we found that it's a really attractive vehicle if there's already all these deployments that they can be utilized also for time synchronization. Um, and this is another project called Gotenna. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it, it allows you to communicate um, with your phone over text without cell service. Um, and they do have a Bitcoin wallet integration, but this is just to kind of show how many people are running their Gotenas, that there really is this kind of latent demand of consumers who want to participate in protocols and have hardware and be a member. And we see that with the LoRa community as well as with Gotenna. Um, so our current progress, as I said, is that we've demonstrated this two nanosecond accuracy and we've been developing this time sync software and we're running these simulations now on this full hardware. We're utilizing a Tendermint consensus engine and demonstrating how to stake tokens on an Ethereum testnet, get access to a subchain, um, and basically exit safely. And we're testing across these multiple protocols. Uh, the next step and what we're currently involved in is working on a custom firmware for this LoRa devices. So we demonstrated by the end of last year that they could synchronize up to two nanoseconds now we need a kind of more sophisticated firmware that's customized so that we can speak to the device and have it interact with our protocol. And that's something we're looking to have um, sometime in April. And once we have that, we'll basically be merging the tests done on the GeoPickle with these actual radios and the firmware that we've got and begin to test them uh, in the new lab where we are based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and we have plans for multiple physical test nets and pilot projects um, and from there, uh, later this year, we'll be releasing and iterating on the software as well as a reference design for a developer board. And so we have a large community of stakeholders who want to be participating and we'll be able to test and synchronize these zones in all different locations and have people basically reporting back the time sync results. So is it synchronized well in a desert versus Japan? We don't know and that's why we're going to need a community of stakeholders to help. So we're kind of enlisting all these cartographers and token holders to kind of become time agents to maintain time sync in their areas and help us build the protocol so we can finalize you know, the reward and uh, punishment schemas because we need all this data first. Um, and so most people always ask us what is like the killer use case for foam? Uh, we think the answer is location itself. Uh, that, that's there's like a long tail of use cases that would need location, especially in a blockchain situation. Uh, the ones we're looking at most closely are in mobility, uh, supply chain, <coughs> IoT, so you're buying data from a device to even know it's out there, um, 
insurance markets, uh, different things like that. Um, and so this was a long concluding paragraph. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so like I said, all those, there's this whole class of low-power radios. They're all competing to be in the phone of the future, every IoT device of the future. Yeah. Currently, none are in any phone, um, but it's very simple to uh, communicate with like a dongle over Bluetooth. Yeah, okay. And so maybe that's the first step of people who want to use it as a location customer. Yeah. But more realistically, it's such a cheap component, it would be built into the car, built into a scooter, built into a bike. You could walk up to it and control it over Bluetooth. So it's small, like... Uh... Yes, yeah, as the end point. The zone anchors would be larger, like a router, yeah, but yeah. then the actual endpoint would be like the size of a keychain or something like that. It could be optimized to be in a phone, so maybe for partners, someone like Samsung, who's adding cryptographic features to the phone, maybe they would want to add this radio to get ahead of the competition. Yeah. I want to say that I think that's the best presentation I've ever seen. Wow. Yeah, very humbling. <laughs> and, and then on top of that, I wanted to say, um, have you ever thought about like setting up the, like, setting up the system in the real world, but Yeah, definitely. So you could be playing completely in a virtual world, and then you have a quest that leads into the real world, and you'd have to go to just your Google's office, uh, and you could like unlock a gaming <laughs> item in your game world. So you could definitely design the overlap. Like I that. was thinking reverse of that. Okay. Like you're setting it up in the physical world, but in the game state, it changes. You now have like a, a, an address in the virtual world. Yeah. You, see, like, you can definitely do that. Like our idea is to make the system as like simple and open as possible. So it like does one thing. You can like produce a presence claim and trust it. And then applications can define all their own logic. So they could be like, you have to get eight of these to do it, or eight within an hour, or eight within two weeks, because maybe one's for an insurance claim, the other's for like a cloud-based game. So these applications can kind of bring their own security requirements and give their own logics. And then you could design a game where it's like, if you went here, it opened up a portal into the digital world. And yeah, this would just be one tool that things could hook into, but we think it's like one of the main tools missing for any use case that wants to touch the real world. But you could transcend time in virtual world and physical world. Like, you know, like yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so? I wonder if you could speak to the cost for the cost of setting up a node. Uh, definitely. So the it's not set in stone, but I can give some numbers. So like the LoRa chip itself, if we were to go with that, is like. 10 or $15 as a chip. Um, the developer boards we're building on right now are $45 or $50 that includes the chip, and then with the Raspberry Pi, so you're looking at a pretty low cost for these like, developer boards. The actual zone anchors will be gateway devices, so they have like multiple chips and can listen on multiple frequencies, and existing LoRa gateways range between $300 and $3,000. Um, and the ones that are more expensive is because of different like licensing overhead. Like the Cisco one is 300, but the other one is three. I think the Cisco one's 3,000, the other one's 300. So that's like the complications of like why they might get more expensive, but it's nowhere near the kind of upfront cost of like a mining farm for Bitcoin or Ethereum. So ultimately, like whether the cost of the gateway is $1,000 or 5,000, it's not gonna go like exponentially higher and the difficulty is different, so it what doesn't get, you don't need more expensive hardware over time to compete. Uh, yeah, What's, is there like a market place for the presence cost? Like do the anchors set the cost for a presence claim? How does that work? Yeah, so the, <laughs> you're gonna use the phone token as like a work token, so you, like a taxi medallion to participate and uh, offer service. But then you can charge uh, your revenue and presence claims in any currency, so DAI or Ether. And it's going to vary completely by uh, what are the restrictions of the zone operator. So let's say in Palo Alto, where real estate is astronomical, maybe you're going to charge more for your presence claims because your operational costs includes having access to all these locations. 
where you just have a path of zone on some random highway, you're lucky to get a customer, so you might put that your, your fees are super low. It could be that there's like surge pricing um, because there's limited amount of messages that can go over radio at a time. So in Times Square during rush hour, maybe um, the zone anchors raise the fees and they only accept the messages that have the highest rate. So it can be dynamic, um, but there's a different aspect of the system called signaling. Uh, where you can stake tokens in an area which uh, affects the mining rewards. <coughs> and so that's kind of a way that hopefully um, people won't over congest areas or they'll be incentivized to spread out. Um, but this project has so many unknown unknowns that only through mass testing and mass participation could we come to really define those kind of numbers. Uh, yeah. I'll get to you next, sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, uh, what's the state of the art today in terms of uh, how people address GPS spoofing and lack of verified Yeah, so the state of the art is um, usually like an enormous amount of band-aids and money. So like in Uber, drivers were instead of in a straight line spoofing GPS, so they went like this, and they would like charge triple for the amount of ride and like drain a lot of money. And so tons of money goes into like spoofing algorithms, AI detection, things like that, and that's just one company, and then every company is like replicating them. Um, does that answer your question? I'm just wondering, so is it only, it's only the proof of present cla presence claims that get processed on a higher chain, or is it like sort of proof of? The whole log of the zone. Yeah, so like whenever they're confirming synchronization, that's getting posted onto the Ethereum chain or whatever it is as well? The verification of it. Okay. Like they would keep a local log, <coughs> and maybe there's some data availability problems of how long they keep it or not, and that is viewable by the verifier, and then kind of the proof, the Merkle root that it's verified gets posted to the root chain, and then that tells the mining contract that they're eligible for rewards. Right, because it would be invalid when the proof of presence was posted if they hadn't been keeping a valid block the entire time. Yeah, so the zone has to like just, even if they have no customers, they have to keep synchronizing, keep publishing their logs to get the mining rewards. And as soon as they stop publishing the log, they're breaking their service all over. Um, so two questions. I think the first one, um, I don't know much about radio. Is there any way to like civil attack that, or like, is there anything kind of going on with radio that you can kind of like, uh, I don't know, radio jam? That's like yeah. A space well, one sort of jamming, like, which is like you could yeah. just disrupt the whole network for everyone. Um, civil attack is definitely something that could happen, and what we're looking to address. Um, the idea is that you have multiple zones and overlapping zones. So if one zone anchor wanted to say, "Hey, Ryan actually was here," put it in your log. No one else who was listening over radio would have that message in their okay. log, so eventually they would be found out. Okay. So you can have this kind of like potential collusion, um, but we're working to make yeah. it be not the case. Yeah. I mean, like if location of uh, these zones is fixed, then the att attacking is very simple in terms of jamming. Like, you, if you know the locations of the zones, <coughs> are the, zones are the, the nodes are located, you can easily jam each one of them wherever. Yeah, I mean, you can do a denial of service, but with enough, one, it's illegal. <laughs> to, so then you would have like an attacker that's willing to like go to Times Square, break the law, and be jamming zones for what purpose? So that they get slashed. You could have like a counter attack, you can have like a counter where people don't get slashed if every zone goes out at the same time, because then it might be an earthquake or it might be a jamming event. Because if they're denying service, where do they get out of it other than blocking the service? They're not making any money off of that as the attacker. Uh, in the Laura one, yeah. There's like a min minimum wage to be guaranteed between each one. Mm -hmm. So you probably are slashing if someone sends like a flat pulse or something that's like longer than the shirt would be. Yeah. Like, you're not a problem. It just wouldn't get picked up as a packet. Yeah, it just wouldn't be a valid message. If it's not like a little bit more signal. I just, I just meant someone who's jamming will probably not send chirps, right? It would most yeah. likely be saw waves just because. Uh, do you have multiple zones in the in the same physical space 
Yeah, yeah, you could have zones that overlap, and then you could have zones that all have like different service level agreements. So one guy signed to be in Tribeca for a year, and in that time you had tons of other zones appear that overlapped with it. And so when you have this overlap of zones that each have their own agreements, that's when you get the more security because if a, one message showed up in one zone, it should have been in all the others as well. Well, if you were going to charge for a presence claim, like how would you determine then which zone attributed to that presence claim? Uh, it could work in a number of ways. You as like a power user could subscribe to which zone you wanted and send out a custom message, or it could be like first come, first served, where we heard your message and signed it first, got the payment. What are some of like, the biggest uh, assumptions that you make in order to you know, proceed proof, dynamic proof of location working in terms of like scaling Ethereum? In terms of scaling Ethereum? Yeah. So I would say that um, dynamic proof of location is pretty independent of Ethereum and would kind of be a valid project without Ethereum existing. Like e Bitcoin could hypothetically be used as the root chain. Um, the root chain is kind of just like something asynchronous so it's like the most secure and like the slowest and where like everything could be finalized and where it's like safe to stake your tokens. So right now we're assuming that's Ethereum um, but it could be Ethereum 2.0, it could be a Cosmos, it could be a substrate chain, it could be Definity. It's kind of like the last piece of the puzzle ironically from us where obviously right now we're using Ethereum and doing these staking contracts as Ethereum contracts but uh, ultimately that's like the least bottleneck. that one of the limitations of DPS right now is it's one way, and you were saying that uh, you kind of offer the ability to do two way, but with such a low band and low power, like what kind of messages do you anticipate on the upload side of things? Just like basic text, or? Yeah, so in our case, 90% of the message is the public key. <laughs> it takes up 90%, and it's just timestamps. So it's like, um, it's a quite a different order of magnitude of like a project like LivePeer, and it's like transcoding gigabytes of data, where we have like, this is like 36 bytes. And then the logs are just like bytes and like just timestamps. And then you have the public uh, key. So yeah, the LoRa like is very limited in bandwidth. It's very low bandwidth. Uh, how uh, uh, how do zones get formed? Like are they assembled as zones? Uh, great question. Um, so from the blockchain point of view, you would have to stake tokens into a contract, and that contract is saying that you're like going to run a zone and you're capable of running it and being honest. Um, and then, so once you fulfill that requirement, you would basically turn it on and start running it. Um, and once you're like synchronized, you would be a valid zone. Um, and so that's like the basically cupcake scenario of how it works. Okay. But the real way like you would deploy it is the first zone in an area kind of has to be like a trust anchored zone. So that through some sort of ceremony or procedure, we would set up a zone that everybody agrees or knows about. Um, and then you, when you have zones that form near it, um, they're already overlapping with the trust zone. So eventually that one could be removed. And then new zones that appear nearby, they're always overlapping with the pre-existing system so that they can be recognized by the system. The real challenging is how do you have a new zone appear not connected to the existing one? Um, and for that, we have this idea that there's an actor called a mobile verifier. So it's like a location customer, but their job is to buy location claims in existing zones. And then uh, new zones need to attract a certain amount of tokens uh, by these verifiers to come to their zone and buy a presence claim. And once they pass some sort of threshold, they would be eligible for rewards as well. And so you kind of connect the new zone to the old zone topographically through the network by having one actor who's been over here come over there and if enough people did that, you've kind of connected the new zone that's in a field by itself to the rest of the system. And so a zone is the minimal, minimal amount of like way to participate. Yeah, minimum uh, amount, and it could be one person sets up four beacons, or you could, you know, you fulfilled the requirements, and you just turn it on, and you see if it can find any zone that you could join. Yeah, better with the other places. And each anchor is one zone only, right? Like zones are entirely distinct. <coughs> you can't have a node that is uh, an anchor with multiple zones. Uh, you can, because if it's a gateway, it could have multiple bands or multiple uh, chips on it. So a zone is made up of pairwise connections, and each of those connections don't necessarily need to connect with each other. And then you could have one zone anchor that is like the crux between two zones, potentially. 
There's a bunch of like weird geometry and uh, vectors like we'll dive into a few in the future. Sorry, I have to just go to the, big, the first half. Um, where did we come up with like hours and seconds? So when I'm thinking about time, the only thing I like objectively, I'm like, okay, there's a day that we could probably do like you know the sun goes around, um, and I guess like the sundial, but you know, and yeah. how do we like prove what 60 minutes is? And I don't know any of that. Um, hard to <laughs> back up. Yes. Um, so like, there's no. Um, like reference to our time in the system. Oh, I'm not, I'm I'm more okay, that was more historical. Right. Oh, historically. Yeah, the where you. Oh, I see. Um, wait, can you repeat? The like, question? where where did we come up with an hour? Um, I think About through tracking the and sun. And like, how did we get like a yeah? I guess I'm just trying to think how we. I think like, tracking the sun night and day and twelve the hours. Of, yeah, I'm just. Babylonians had a thing for 12s. Okay. It was outside, really, yeah, 12s. It was outside yeah. the scope yeah. of my research. No, and it was, the first half was just like, oh, I was like, oh, it's time. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. What sort of cool, like, services or protocol can you build on top of this as a candidate? Um, I can think of a lot. Um, I think some blockchain specific ones. So, like, Cosmos just launched, if you guys are familiar. It's a proof of stake blockchain. Uh, you could do something like they have 100 validators. You can enforce a geographic distribution of validators. Um, another blockchain one like Filecoin ensures files are on different disks, but how do you know they're not all in the same warehouse that just burnt down? Um, Can you build a new Filecoin? Filecoin added proof location to the roadmap. Okay. Um, like geofenced voting, geospecific stable coins uh, to yeah, just yeah. control spending in one specific area. Um, I like like uh, insurance examples. Like I bought a smart train ticket. Train's not here. I'm here. Boom! I got a refund. Like um, I was talking to like Niantic of Pokemon Go. They wanted to. Um, partner with stores so that people who went there for Pokestops, um, a percent of the revenue would go to Pokemon, but everybody spoofed their GPS and they had no idea if people actually went to these stores or not. So like that's a revenue model that is like lost. The amount of money spent in supply chain and uh, mobility fleets, it's super expensive to track a fleet of taxis or cars. Not like an Uber, just like a guy who has a trucking company uh, to pay for the GPS equipment, the GPS receivers, and people could still spoof it. So. Um, all regular use cases we have today, like package delivery, um, data availability, things like that. But we hoping that with the new level of security it brings, that you can open up new kinds of markets, new types of applications, uh, hooking into all the other blockchain momentum companies. All right, all up there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your attention.